Great. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction as well as for the invitation to, to be here to talk to you today about uh, Latin America and global value chains. Um, it's a little bit of a change of pace and it's probably what, uh, maybe welcome at the end of the day, just something different to um, switch things up. I have the unenviable position of being the very last one to go. Um, I'm going to provide a bit of a user perspective. Um, uh, I am a researcher at the Global Value Chain Center. We changed our name recently at Duke University. And we've spent a lot of the last 10 years um, looking at Latin America in, in particular and trying to work with policymakers of what global value chains and global trade means for local firms and local workers in these countries um, and how to, to use global value chains in order to improve de developmental outcomes. So this is a, a quite a different perspective, um, uh, although many of the topics, particularly mining, have been uh, brought up here already today. Um, but I want to make three kind of key overall points. Latin America and the Caribbean as a whole is considered to be a latecomer region to global value chains. Um, but participation is growing, uh, it's driving exports, and it's leading to a growing number of firms and workers in the region engaging in, in global trade. The second is, as, we can be, as can be expected, the, country, the, regions and the, country, the countries in the region um, are integrated into the traditional resources-based activities. Um, this can be expected due to the strong comparative advantage of these. But there's also a high presence in high-tech manufacturing and services, um, which is not necessarily expected. And then, third point, that upgrading um, GVC lingo for adding value uh, within these uh, industries, upgrading into higher value activities within each of these chains and into higher value sectors is creating new important job opportunities. So, Part of, uh, I think, what's exciting about being here today and hearing about the advances that are being made in the statistics community is that a lot of this work over the last 10 years, we've had to do on a case study basis and with extensive field research because the statistics simply haven't been available for us to do our work. So it's really exciting hearing uh, the progress in these areas. So to start off, I'd like to as part of an uh, illustration of that, uh, provide the, a snapshot of the region in, um, in global value chains. The data is dated, but this is from the 2013 and 2015 uh, OECD and UNCTAD work, which is one of the, the, the first ones to bring together this data um, using the trade and value added. But if we look at this, Latin America and the Caribbean was trailing pretty much every other region uh, in the world in terms, of, uh, in terms of both GBC participation and domestic value added, including Africa. Um, this is not a, and by a significant margin at the same point, uh, some 14% percentage points behind Africa in terms of GBC participation, as well as a considerable lag in terms of value added. Um, the low value added suggests that the firms in Latin America and the workers in Latin America engaged in fairly basic activities, some routine assembly work um, and maybe some more production work. However, we were seeing something different in our, in our case studies and I think it's useful to, to start to unpack the region and look at it in, in um, a more broken down way because Latin America and its participation in GVCs, of course, is heterogeneous. Some, these are some loose categories that I think are useful for trying to understand how, what exactly the region is doing in the industry, in, the, in global value chains. And I would divide it into four, loo four loose groups. Those with proximity to the United States. Now this group uh, includes Mexico, as Francisco uh, highlighted to us, uh, Mexico and a lot of the Central American countries. They've been able to leverage um, their low-cost labor and their relative low-cost land um, and their proximity to the United States to use GVC-oriented policies for low-tariff trade, for intermediate goods, goods coming in for processing, in order to integrate into manufacturing chains or into the, to the U.S. market. The second large group are the resource-rich countries. 
Um, a lot of these countries on the west coast of Latin America, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, um, these countries have been integrated into value chains for quite some time because they're producing primary commodities that are used in a lot of downstream industries around the world. Then the large domestic market countries. And here I really, um, two key countries on this, Brazil and Argentina. Um, they are more, more developed economies, they're resource-based economies as well, but they have the advantage of having a large population. So in terms of having a large population, they've been able to attract a lot of investment who are interested in targeting that market. But at the same time, they've got more restrictive trade policies. So we see the balance there of a lower overall GBC participation, but a high backward linkages, a high value added uh, for the sectors in which they're participating, because they encourage the use of um, local suppliers. And then the small island states. Um, these countries are a lot of them, most of them in the Caribbean. Um, their scale and their lack of connectivity to markets really limits their ability to engage in GVCs, um, particularly goods-based in, in a meaningful way. And so we see those, those countries pri primarily participating in some very niche uh, agricultural chains, maybe coffee, uh, high-value cacao, um, as well as in, in services industries. So if we break it down further and we start to look at a country-by-country country basis, um, we see a lot of countries are definitely participating in agriculture um, at the top. A handful then in extractive sectors, um, a few more in, in low-value uh, apparel, GVCs, um, some in high-value added, but the bulk is really in the agricultural, in the agricultural sector. So what does this participation mean for, for workers and jobs and skills um, on, a, on a local uh, basis? So basically, as a general rule, skills requirements increase as the value-added activity increases. So, for example, in the agricultural sector, if you're just doing production activities and shipping out a fairly basic product, you are relying on a relatively unskilled labor force, low and medium size will make up the bulk of it. But as you move into more sophisticated activities, say the introduction of precision agriculture, a lot more data analysis, or even to R&D, the development of new varieties, you're going to need to rely on a much uh, more skilled labor force. And the same in the, in, the, in the other direction. If you're moving into higher value-added higher value added, um, industries, so say agriculture down the chain into business services, exports, you're going to be relying on a much higher value, uh, a higher skilled workforce. So what does the data tell us? That yes, um, the bulk of the, uh, the, the, the workers are in um, low skilled work. Uh, the red shows us that. But over time, over the past 10 years, this is drawing on ILO data, over the past 10 years, we've seen a shift as these economies are upgrading within these different value chains. The, the green line is moving closer in this direction, indicating that these industries are starting to rely on more and more educated, um, a more and more educated population. And then the offshore services industry, for example, um, which is a lot of what we've been talking about today, but just in a different terms, the ICT industry and the services provided behind that um, really relies on a very sophisticated labor force from a skills perspective. So I think a, a, a few cases are, are, are important to illustrate, um, to illustrate this. And I'm going to just give a, a few examples from each of the, the different... Uh, economic sectors, so high-value agriculture, um, extractive sectors, manufacturing high and low value, and a quick touch on services. And in the spirit of the, the, the conference, try and provide you with a glimpse of what's happening in Latin America in terms of digital. What does digital mean in these sectoral um, examples? So in terms of high-value agriculture, this is an area in where Latin America is really performing very well. Um, the, it has a very high level of GVC participation globally. The region is the second largest global exporter by value and by volume of high value uh, fruits. So this is mainly for your fruits and your vegetables. These are high margin agricultural products as opposed to say soya or um, maize or wheat. 
What's more interesting is when we start to look at the suppliers, the firms from Latin America and what they're doing, uh, they're not simply providing, growing, a, growing some cherries and shipping them off, but these firms have been very, very strategic, they're growing considerably, they're functionally upgrading into R&D, um, they're in downstream logistics, they're in distribution, they're in marketing, and in some, company, in some countries, in some key markets, Chilean or Peruvian firms, uh, or those from uh, other countries in the region are even the ones packing the supermarket shelves with their products uh, in those key markets. So they've really upgraded throughout the entire chain. They've also geographically diversified, and this brings more and more complexity into our discussion of the statistics and what we need uh, to be measuring. All these firms are, so numerous of these firms have, been, have moved into all major production zones, Chile, Peru, Colombia, California, Spain, Morocco, China, in order to be able to provide the markets from those sectors. They've also changed the product base, the product mix, instead of just being in um, apples and, and, say, oranges, relatively low-value fruit, if we're talking within the fruit thing, these firms have upgraded into the high-value value sectors. Uh, for those Chileans in the room, I know everybody's experienced the rise of the avocados. Every time they go to the feria, it's a little bit of a shock how much more expensive avocados are. But that's because these are being exported abroad in a large sense of them. Cherries as well. Chile is a massive new cherry producer. A lot of these go to China. Uh, so a lot of these products net a much higher value price. But in terms of digital, these firms are also on the cutting edge. A lot, of the, a lot of the firms here are either developing technologies along with IT firms in other parts of the world or here in Chile, or they're already adopting them. Um, adopting, um, uh, adopting precision agriculture, exploring the potential for agroponics or growing berries in a container, um, really exploring new ways of applying these digital technologies to the industry. So here, I want to focus on the case of Peru. Um, this is, again, it's, a, it's an interesting case because it's been uh, such significant growth in a very short amount of time in terms of their insertion into this industry. In 2002, the, the country exported just 300 um, and change million in, in the industry. By 2017, this was up to 3.8 billion. This is a significant jump. So what was it that was driving this industry's growth? What was it behind there? Was it foreign firms coming in and investing and developing this? And is this all based on foreign capital and foreign technology? Or were local firms playing a role? So this is using uh, microdata, uh, the graphic here to just draw your attention to that, microdata on um, exports. From, from the Peruvian customs. And we broke down and we looked at all the leading exporters of these fruits uh, and vegetables in the country and tried to identify their uh, evolution, their patterns, how they were growing. And so you can see here in 2002, um, most firms were focused on... So, oh, before I get into it, we've, we realized there was a significant portion of Peruvian firms in that base. They were obviously foreign firms as well, but we were... Um, we were able to identify that a significant share were Peruvian. So we took a look at what the Peruvian firms were doing. So in 2002, they were based mainly on asparagus. Um, and then, but in 2004, they already were starting to shift into planting avocados and exporting avocados, and very quickly began to add mangoes, grapes, peppers, even some of them now produce shrimp as, as well in, in aquaculture. These firms are also not just producing the product, but they're also upgrading. Um, they're not necessarily as, as sophisticated as some of the firms coming out of Chile, for example, but they've also upgraded into new higher value added activities and logistics um, and coordinating in order to be able to capture greater shares of value. In terms of labor, it's had a very important effect um, in terms of driving direct labor costs, uh, thanks to changes in the labor legislation. So in terms of low-value manufacturing, I'm really only going to spend a minute on this. Um, the, most of the, the low-value added manufacturing, and by that, most of us in global value chains refer to uh, the apparel industry, the first industry to really uh, globalize to this extent. Um, 
Most of the countries that are still participating in this are those in Central America. Uh, most other countries, even Peru with Pima Cotton, have really seen their participation in the industry decline. Um, the countries that are participating, they're all performing relatively similar roles. They're in um, the production assembly of the final, the final products. In some countries, they're, they're uh, manufacturing the, the fabric and the yarn as well, but in most cases, it's, um, it's a cut, make, trim operation. Overall, the region's really lost competitiveness in this focus. Most of these industries have concentrated now in, in Asia, and it's very difficult to compete against that concentration. But in advanced manufacturing, there are some, uh, some more interesting uh, cases. Uh, and these perhaps are surprising, say the aerospace industry. Uh, Mexico has established a, a good fitting in the, in the aerospace global value chain. Um, in the medical devices sector as well, which is everything from syringes to pacemakers and uh, an MRI machine. Um, there are several players in that industry as well. Most of them have made their way into the industry in the same way, coming in with a basic activity, assembling, uh, say, catheters, putting plastic tubes together and putting an end on them for export. But gradually, many of them have, have upgraded. So to draw your attention to two of these countries, Costa Rica and Dominican Republic, perhaps unlikely candidates for major manufacturers uh, globally, but... Um, both countries have established an important um, presence in the medical devices sector. Um, in fact, it's become so important for the economies that in Costa Rica, it is the number one export sector for the country. It surpassed agriculture as the exports in 2018, I believe, and now makes up 23% of the country's exports. And Dominican Republic as well, it's the, mo the most significant export. Um, Looking at, again, we were able to look at, um, at micro-level data from the uh, Banco Central in, in Costa Rica, and we were able to link that with wage workforce and gender, gender data. And what we were able to see is that the workforce for these industries is particularly highly skilled. Um, at a minimum, everybody has a high school education in order to participate. And it has very strong female participation, which makes it an exception among some of the advanced manufacturing sectors. Extractive industries, and this is, I think, uh, obviously a favorite topic here. Uh, here I will talk about Chile. Um, most of the region does have participation in the, manu in the, in the extractive sector, either in oil and gas or in mining. Um, different participation in different ways. For example, Chile exports about half of its output as refined copper, whereas in Peru, it's only about 15%. They're still focused in very much an extraction stage of the, of the chain. Um, it's a key contributor to downstre downstream industries, but um, I believe Elias brought this up. The capital intensity means it's not, uh, it doesn't generate a, a significant amount of direct employment. Um, and it also has fewer opportunities for local firms. The mining industry is typically dominated by large multinationals in these, um, a lot of the countries in the region, and so um, they tend to source from their large global suppliers. So in terms of Chile, and just here I'd like to link it to, to digital technology, we've been looking at um, questions of how much digital technology is being adopted in the industry in Chile. Obviously, we all know that the Chilean copper sector is the most one of the most important sectors in the economy. Um, from an employment perspective, it's only 2% of direct national employment. But there's some very interesting changes happening in terms of digitalization. El Teniente is one of uh, the oldest mines here uh, in Chile. El Teniente is now being operated by an integrated control center 100 kilometers away from the mine. It's being run out of Rancagua. Uh, Ministrales, another big uh, mine in the north of Chile, its processing plant is being operated from Santiago. Escondida is building operation centers here in Santiago as well. And so this basically means you're going to have, um, your workers can now participate uh, in the mining industry at a distance um, from remote operation center. There was a question of, is, has this been technology substituting labor? In much of the industry so far, the technology hasn't substituted the labor yet. 
the same operators are operating the new technology at a distance, so we're not seeing changes uh, from that perspective. But this data here, which is from the Consejo Competencia Minera, shows the direction in which um, remote operation uh, is going, and it continues to up, um, increase in, in all industries, including in the, the maintenance um, segment of, of the value chain. And I believe uh, Dylan brought this up with his example of Caterpillar and the uh, Internet of Things. And maintenance now, a large share of going out to check the equipment, stopping the mine, finding out what's wrong with the piece of equipment, is now being done at a distance. So this is really sh changing the shape. Those services are also in a position to be done from abroad. If you can do it from Santiago, is there a reason not to do it from somewhere else in another country? Or is there a reason why Chilean services providers who become specialists in this technology can't do it for other mines uh, around the world? Um, here, it, this is the uh, offshore services value chain. I mentioned the IT uh, industry is the kind of the backbone of the digital discussion here. Um, perhaps we don't, don't always take a step back to, to see how it's operating. Um, but the, um, here in terms of the, I, most people are familiar with, with, with this piece here, the inter information technology outsourcing. And that's the part that is having the impact on, on a lot of the digitalization in these industries. Most countries, most companies around the world, or many companies around the world, are relying on India still. India entered this industry very early. Um, in the 1990s, the era, a lot of outsourcing was going to India, and Indian firms have continued to build strengths and are now providing a lot of the digital backbone. But Latin America has also been there in the background, built, steadily building its, its um, pres presence in the industry. Um, Mexico has become very strong in IT services. Chile is also developing IT services. Uruguay as well. Um, and a lot of these services that are coming out of these countries have uh, the advantage of being able to link them to vertical industries in which these economies are doing very well. Um, the, one of the classic examples in, in our area is the Uruguay example of the cows. They have more cattle in Uruguay than people, um, and in order to be able to maintain uh, food standards um, and uh, the health standards for the, the, the meat industry, they have developed a very sophisticated IT tracking system that, can, that, data, that predates a lot of the IoT, more sophisticated sensors that we have now. So they were already developing and selling this technology and these services um, abroad. So just in closing, um, I, uh, the definitely the impacts of the GVC are considerably higher than the aggregate suggestion of perhaps that we saw in terms of the 40%. Um, we're still short on statistics, uh, disaggregated statistics. Um, a lot of the, the GVC analysis that we're doing where we're trying to understand where firms and workers participate, we really need to go beyond a general description of, say, agriculture. We need to dig into agriculture. What does agriculture mean? Which part of it? And that's because the markets are different, the buyers are different, the key actors are different in the, in the sector. The skills that you need for that sector are different. So we really need a level of disaggregation. But despite the region's relatively weak participation in, um, in manufacturing, it's become very strong in other areas. Um, and I think this is an important uh, for us to keep in mind in terms of development model, these upgrading within these other value chains has, tr has tremendous uh, value as well. Because, as we see in the case of Costa Rica and others, I didn't put the data up there, it's really driving an increase in exports and in, in good quality job creation. So, uh, with that, thank you. I did also ma manage to make it on time and everybody can uh, get, get on uh, with the rest of their day.